Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to our session on burns, burns outcome, and uh, the aspect of burns, complex wounds, the psychological and long-term outcomes. Uh, my name is Mark Jeschke. I'm a burn surgeon from Sunnybrook, uh, and I will introduce the other two speakers as well. Uh, they both are all from Sunnybrook, so it's a little Sunnybrook session from Toronto. Uh, but nonetheless, I hope it's uh, informative to you. So the, we have half an hour for each talk, so I would say we talk about 20, 25 minutes and leave some plenty of time for discussion or questions afterwards. Feel, feel free to ask uh, whatever you like. The, I have the task of leading you into burns and the pathophysiology or what's actually happening to burns. And I'm not sure how many of you take care of big burns or larger burns, but uh, um, I will try to show you what's happening and what our current treatment challenges and what we currently do. And again, what's essential for burn patients also to survive. And I start with this, you just had lunch, so disclaimer is you will see some bad pictures. Please, uh, I know you've seen probably a lot of bad pictures, but you will see some bad ones. So this is just a disclaimer. Um, why in general, why is burn important? Or what does burn do in terms of thought process or recognition, anything? And to be honest, nobody thinks about a burn injury. It's not in our foremind. We think about heart attacks, we think about strokes, we think about cancer. We don't think about burns. And so the, this young lady, about seven, eight years ago, didn't think about burn either uh, until fr Thursday night when her friend told her, uh, put this accelerant on this bonfire, let's make it a little bit bigger. And she ended up with uh, 20 to 30% burn in our ICU. And in general, burns has been described um, by many as very detrimental and traumatic. This patient is a young mom of 18. She delivered her baby six months ago. And she was working in a factory uh, producing firecrackers. And it exploded on her, and you see the shrapnel of the cartilage in her. And she suffered a 90% fatal burn more that she didn't survive several weeks into the hospital. But she just had a baby. So you can imagine the, uh, the traumatic aspect, not only for her, but also for the family and for, obviously, her child that is coming, um, growing up without her mom. Um, and in general, when you look, oops, uh, when you uh, ask people about burns, they, you see here to the right, there's no laser point on here, but if you look at to the right, the lady with the finger holding up, she's a Japanese supermodel, and she has a 0.01% burn, and she describes it as the worst injury she's ever had. But you see examples, so burns can happen anytime, anywhere, and again, you as wound specialists, or even sitting in emergencies or in other hospitals, are exposed then to these traumatic events. And then you can ask yourself, all right, what do we do with these patients? Or what do we now learn about these patients? Worldwide, burns actually have quite an impact. Um, it's 11 million people each year that get burned. So it's 30,000 people every day have a burn injury. It's quite a lot. 180,000 fire that burn deaths. So that means somebody dies every three minutes from a burn injury. And uh, when we look at US, we have about 410,000 burn injuries that are occurring in the US, 40,000 requiring hospitalization, about a tenth. In Canada, we have 44,000 burns a year and 3,000 hospitalizations. So quite, quite an impactful injury pattern, again, that we are, I'm sure not everybody is aware of. And uh, when we actually think about this too, on a global aspect, it's not so much we in the civilized and first nation aspect, and the, in the first, uh, first country and civilized countries, uh, you see North America up there, it's very small. But you see, where is the need for burn care? Where is the need that we can improve and have an impact in burn outcomes? Is more or less in this old, old world like India, uh, in Africa. This is where burns occur. This is where the LD50, the lethal burn size associated with 50% mortality, is quite smaller than what we have here in Canada. And therefore, there is the aspect of knowledge translation. And I think we all recognize now as civilized countries is what we have to do is to conduct studies as teams, as multi-center teams, and then conduct translation. Uh, take the knowledge and transfer it into these centers in a third world country. And University of Toronto, as other universities not in the US, have these programs where you can develop certain aspects and then take them into these countries to improve the outcome. In general, however, burns has significantly improved. The outcomes of burns have significantly improved over the last three, four decades. When you look at the, this chart, um, you see in the table, it used to be like a 15 to 44-year-old patient. LD50 was 46%, now at 82. Uh, children, 0 to 14, where it used to be a 50% burn, was associated with 50% mortality not so long ago, just after World War II. Um, you see there, nowadays, we're at 
So we made significant improvements. And the only population we struggle with is uh, the elderly population. Um, that is beyond the scope of this. But the elderly population is a struggle. And we, to this day, we have not improved the outcome significantly. But <clears throat> why have we improved? Or what do we need further to improve survival? And how do we analyze what we have done? Um, the biggest impact post-World War II was when we started antibiotic skin bank ventilators. It's in the 50s. And that you see the slight uh, increase to the 70s. And then in the 70s, in, I think the single-handedly revolutionized aspect was the implementation of early surgery. It was Dr. Jendenkovich in Eastern Europe. She was a surgeon. And she postulated, because she didn't have adequate coverage of wounds, and she didn't believe in that, she was the one doing the early excision, what we do nowadays all over the world. And it came from her. And she was really accused. It was very hard for her to put this uh, therapeutic approach into practice. But nowadays, everybody does it. And you see here, when you look at our graphs, our LD50 went to 70% over this decade, where she implemented the, when you have a big burn, you have to go to the OR 24, 48 hours the latest, and take the burns, burns off as much as you can. And this really changed our outcome significantly. Then we formed units, burn units, in the 80s. So it's not even that long ago, 30 years ago, that we formed burn units. There were no units. There were no specialists. The patients were usually parked in the basement because they had a bad smell. There was no OR time. There was no scrubbing. There was no tubbing. And burn patients were just shoved in some corner. Um, and uh, therefore, they were forgotten. They were not treated adequately. But that changed then again in the 80s when we realized we need common burn units. And you see there, early surgery, antibiotics, burn units, pushed us up to the 80s, 90s. And nowadays, we're in the 95, 96 range because we also implemented ICU protocols. And that clearly are also, from the critical care aspect, synchronized, protocolized our care, how that we definitely improve the outcome. And when you look, um, when you look at our data, what differentiates a survivor to a non-survivor, you can, you, can, you can clearly identify various aspects. But it's very common that nowadays a patient has overall, per se, a very good chance to survive. The main contributors nowadays to burn death is sepsis and infection and multi-organ failure. This is what we as critical care physicians and burn surgeons struggle with. And this is our, our own data um, uh, where we looked at the, at the differences in survivors and non-survivors. And you see here the MOF. Uh, the infections and the sepsis aspect. So when we looked more closely, can we improve something further, or can we divide these patients into something that we focus, individualize our treatment approach? So nowadays, we all talk about individualizing genomic prediction, proteomic prediction, individualized care. So we tried to do this for burn patients as well. And when you look at our curve when patients not survive, you see the steep uh, decline in the first period. You see the next decline here in these periods. And it's very interesting because you can assign these periods to specific incidences that occur in the clinical course. And it is mainly the immediate phase is your first decline. And your immediate phase is when you get a big burn patient in your emergency or somewhere where it, his life or her life depends on you acting adequately to resuscitate, to ascrotomize, to put the wound dressing on, keep him warm, to intubate, give the tetanus, give what is needed, and refer to a burn center. This is the immediate phase. If that fails, your prognosis subsequently is pretty poor. And again, this is usually where, we're not, where we don't even see the patient, because it's in the large province of Ontario or even Canada, is where we don't get the patients immediately. But this is the, one of the crucial phases. We then earn, enter, when the patient then comes to us um, in other burn centers, when we fight, basically the early phase is uh, that is detrimental, is hypermetabolism, organ function, and infection. The middle phase, 10 to 30 days, where patients die off, it is, again, metabol hypermetabolism. It is the wound healing that determines this. And then late, we have metabolic consequences, again, wounds, infection, and sepsis. So you, you see the theme in burns is around wound healing, uh, metabolism, infection, and sepsis, clearly in all these phases. So what should you be doing in terms of when you see the patient in the early phase? The resuscitation aspect. You calculate the burn size based on the rules of ninth. Lund Browder, the common theme, how to calculate the burn size. You basically do the basics. You um, intubate the patient. They're usually ABCDs. The airway, the breathing. You, can, uh, you basically put uh, IVs in. You resuscitate. You assess the neurologic status. Uh, you see where you have to conduct uh, escherotomies. And you basically treat the patient based on burn sizes. 
and maintain circulation via resuscitation. And this is essential. And then you, once you stabilize the patient, you call, if you're not a verified burn center or a large enough burn center with volume, you call for transfer. Why do we resuscitate? And I don't know, you know this, I find it very interesting that our philosophy of resuscitating with 4CC per kg per person burn is based on dogs, and they did six or eight dogs is where they studied it. And what they did at this time, it was Dr. Pruitt in the 70s, um, they basically took um, a burned dog without fluids, and you see the changes, the cardiac output went down, hematocrit went up because they were so hemoconcentrated, the volume went down. So they couldn't circulate their blood flow anymore, and they had a very poor outcome. When they gave the 4cc per kg per percent, you see, see there in dogs, you maintain basically your cardiac output and your hematocrit and your circulation. So based on that study, this is why Parkland is given nowadays as 4cc per kg. It has been criticized, there's no doubt, and I'm gonna go there. But why is this so important? This was done by the current chief of staff at the Shrine in Galveston, Dr. Wolf. He looked in handles of surgery in the 1997, in big burns, over 80% burns, so in really massive burns. What determines the outcomes? And you can't change the injury characteristics. Your age, you can't, burn size, you can't, gender, you can't change this. But what you can change is the fluids and the time to IV. And in a study, he clearly showed if you start IV within two to four hours, better than two, you basically improve the outcome. If you're delayed, the patient will die. And that's why I'm saying it is very essential that you start adequate resuscitation within that time frame. And you, you lay the ground for the patient's outcome. Again, the rest afterwards, you see this. Nothing can be influenced. So the IV time and starting and adequacy determines the outcome of burn patients. But it has been controversially discussed. I'm not sure whether you all know this, but uh, when you have a patient, you resuscitate a patient, there's an under-resuscitation and there's over-resuscitation. So people tended to over-resuscitate for quite some time. They said, well, 4CC may be not ideal. Let's give six and eight or more. The problem is you cause complications. And we know, now, nowadays know, 55 to 100% of patients receive volume in, in excess. They are over-resuscitated. And then Dr. Pruitt termed the phase fluid creep. And that since has been in there. And what happens when you have a fluid creep, you see right there, you have an abdominal compartment, you have pulmonary edema, you have a systemic edema formation, and you have brain edema, so you're in big trouble. So that means you cannot just say, oh, let's give more. Absolutely not. So adequate fluid resuscitation is a key. The, the, the problem is how to monitor it. So usually we put out to you, yeah, look at the urinary output, look at the blood pressure, look at the heart rate, but all these have also issues with monitoring and guiding um, how to ideally resuscitate. And currently there's a lot of work in the literature. It's, it's about uh, how to use fluids. There's a new guideline coming from the ABA just to use two cc's because you go over anyway, uh, not to add anything for inhalation injury, call it usage, closed loop resuscitate, and so forth, or cardiac monitoring with using thermal dilution. But these are novel approaches uh, just for you to give you some better guidance. But we have by no means achieved ideal um, the ideal resuscitation. Well, then you say, well, what can happen when you go to dry? Does it really matter? Yes, it does. Um, we found an increased incidence of renal failure and uh, a slight indication of also increased infections. Well, renal failure can dialyze, but there's also further studies that can go on showing when you have renal failure and acute burn, you have an increased mortality. So you see the pendulum, we call it the pendulum, hasn't swung back. Um, this pendulum is not very clear how to ideally resuscitate. The Australians uh, developed this when you're in the middle of nowhere, just drink beer and water. The only problem is they had detrimental sequelae, so they gave up on the idea of resuscitate with beer. So how to resuscitate a patient again for you is you start Parkland, you try to go four cc's, you give the ringers, you, go all, you do everything that's like a trauma patient. And once you make the call, you call burn referral center, you center your burn center uh, the closest to you, or you have a burn center, and you treat it there. And again, for me, I think that uh, we're working on UTMB, the military, they're working on systems that is a closed loop where basically a patient is monitored, all vitals, cardiac, liver, renal, perfusion, and so forth, all these computerized systems that actually resuscitate a patient based on algorithms. So that takes the user error out. Uh, and I think this will at one point come. Um, when you now enter, maybe uh, from a wound aspect, the next phase, control of infection. Pretty much every burn patient is immunocompromised. Pretty much everybody. 
viruses, bacteria, fungi, whatever you name it, they all grow. And as you heard, it's the main, main killer of uh, burn patients. And you have these alterations, there has been studies in the 80s and 90s and nowadays that burn patients are substantially immunocompromised. And what you can do is what we can treat it topically. The problem is uh, that we did this, and you see here our, de our deaths decreased to zero in 1995. And then it went back up. And I'm not sure you know why that is. Exactly. That was the, that was the Texas data and this is when MRSA, VREs, and whatever came into the game. And all of a sudden, look at this. And nowadays, it's the main killer of uh, pretty much 100% of patients die of infection, sepsis, and morph. So now we have these resistances. And you can't just treat them with tropical agents. Even antibiotics are uh, quite challenging. And what is very, very depressing is when you look at complicating, complicated bacteria, Fusarium, Cyndobacter, VREs, you can see their mortality is see, substantially Look at the acinetobacter, 100% mortality when they are invasive, or the fusarium. So this is a challenge, how to treat it from a topical aspect and how to treat it systemically. And this is the recent study we've done and looked at the leading cause, and you can see here that we changed. Sepsis was a third of the patients, now it's 54, and as I said, nowadays it's actually 70, 80, 90%. So we, we have this unfortunate trend of facing these multi-resistant bacteria that, that cause this mortality in burn patients. The problem also was that burns, didn't have a definition of sepsis. We couldn't do multi trials. We really struggled with what to do. And it was not until Dave Greenhall and then Mansalinas, they subsequently, the, in the 2000s, actually tried to define sepsis. And there, the problem is the system that the, the burn patients have, the symptomatic of any, uh, they're inflammatory, they're hyperinflammatory, they have the symptoms of sepsis. Therefore, it's very hard to diagnose sepsis. And these definitions are just now coming into the game, so it's the, the surviving sepsis campaign has its th third revision. So you see there's a lot of changes and it's even more complicated for burns. So there's current uh, studies going on how to predict sepsis because if you don't know, is it septic or how you're gonna treat it? And that's also a problem we're having. And uh, it's very interesting too, people thought sepsis occurs very late. There's evidence now that sepsis occurs even much earlier that you can have septic episodes even a couple days after burn, which is quite, frightening because you wouldn't expect it at this time. And what is also very quite frightening is when you look at here, if you have sepsis within the 10 days usually after burn, you can treat it. If your sepsis is after 10 days after burn, you see here your mortality is dramatically increased. So you have, you have a problem that your body is burned out, you can't fight off bacteria, you can't fight off anything, you're immune compromised. So again, this is a challenge. But what it also does allow us is to predict sepsis. If we could predict sepsis, we potentially can treat and change the trajectory to survival. So it's an ongoing research aspect of a lot of people saying, how can we predict sepsis? And you may have heard of CRP, procalcitonin, and the summary of all these studies with hundreds of patients, it doesn't work. They do not work. And that's the current challenge is how to predict sepsis. How do you know the patient is at risk of sepsis that you treat him adequately? How are you gonna treat his wounds? What are you gonna put on? And so there's lots of, uh, changes, modifications, which agents, which solutions are the best to treat and prevent sepsis, but this is actually key for us. And again, Dr. Rogers hopefully will enlighten us a little bit about technology, how to treat wounds that are challenging and maybe contaminated, how to get them clean and how to prevent that they die. And then in terms of metabolic responses, one of my favorite topics, I've been studying this for 25 years and not making any progress, so it might, you know, but I still like it. Um, the problem on a burn patient is as you can see here, um, the burn patient is the sickest patient in your hospital. The burn patient has the highest metabolic needs. And to put it in perspective, so you just had some food, you're gonna have an 80 to 90% predicted RE right now, sitting there, relaxed, um, so very calm. You're gonna be right here in this you know, postprandial phase of right there. A burn patient is 1.5 times higher. If you run a marathon, you're probably below a burn in terms of metabolic needs, in terms of nutrients and uh, what you need into protein, amino acid, and so forth. And uh, that is a problem. Why is it a problem? You see here, if you lose 10% of your lean body mass, your mortality is 10%. Uh, decreased wound healing and decubidi occur when you lose 20%. Your mortality is 30% already. If you lose 30 or 40% of lean body mass, your mortality is 100%. Therefore, it is absolutely imperative to change 
uh, and to attenuate your hypermetabolic response. It's just not metabolic demand. You just can't feed. You can't overfeed patients because the problem is you do the opposite. So that is an ongoing challenge. And you can see in this picture of the patient who's becoming, who was a normal patient with normal muscle and just being a stick uh, because of wasting away. And you may have burn patients that are very, like hit apex or muscular or whatever. They leave the hospital just barely having any muscle around them. So that is, a, that is something that's still occurring and that still we haven't gotten control on. And we believe that it is due to elevation of stress hormone, talking about fat pathophysiology. If you look at those hormones, cortisol, epinephrine, you may have heard these fight or flight hormones. They are 100 fold elevated. Look at this. It's basically like somebody, when you get scared, like somebody has, you have this response of tachycardia and like, I want to run away. This is what they have for months. Can you imagine? This is what they endogenously produce every single day for months to come. So you can see how much stress they're in. And uh, this affects, of course, all your organs. This affects your heart, just your muscle, your fat, your glucose levels. And your cardiac output, as you see here, is double what it's supposed to be. So your heart is beating at a rate that is not normal. Kids go up to 150, 180, 190. Adults are at 110, 120. And indicating the issue of these patients are in profound hypermetabolism. And you know it's not good for them. It's actually detrimental. What does it do to the inflammatory system? It's just giving you an overview of the inflammation is associated with this. And if you are looking at mediators, uh, the problem is these mediators are essential and very important. But none of these mediators alone, we tried this to block them, it doesn't work. Because if you block one, something else compensatory picks it up. So it means our patients are still in this hypermetabolic response. They're still losing muscle mass. They're still wasting away. They're still dying. Your liver is massively swollen as well because these patients have peripheral lipolysis. So all your, li your lipids are mobilized and go into your organs. But you can imagine, when you have this, your organs don't function anymore. And we looked at kids, uh, when you are burned, and you see the, the liver there is going from the iliac crest up to the chest, entire abdominal wall. Even adults have a similar extension, but your liver is huge. It doesn't, pr it doesn't work properly anymore. Your clock parameters or your, your hormones, everything is basically shut down and full of fat. So leading to also this, muscle. When you break down amino acids and proteins to so have metabolism, what happens is basically you decrease your, you, you decrease your uh, amino acids and your protein. You don't make any. It's gone. For months and months, you don't make any muscle. You basically use all your muscle, and it's full of fat. So they get, this is the, stre the, the problem we're facing in terms of having metabolism. You're not strong. You can't walk. You have no muscle. And you can imagine and if you have a bedridden patient, what happens? The wounds come in. Pneumonia kicks in. UTI kick in. Patients waste away. Patients get infected, and patients die. So that is an ongoing challenge that we have. And various agents have been tested, but nothing at this time is very successful. And so that is, again, I, I probably have another 25 years to study, and it's not going to go anywhere. Um, the last two topics, very briefly, is I think the most important aspect, however, is closing your burn wound. Um, we will hear about it in a little bit. If we fail to hear a close to close a wound, the patient will not survive. It's, it's actually very simple for us. You, we, why do we do this uh, early excision? You know, you saw it, you improve survival. So to take the burn wood off very quickly is beneficial. It's not only because the inflammatory stimulus is gone, it's also Dr. Desai did a study here looking at how much blood do you lose when you operate immediately and later and later and later. You see here that immediately is better. You lose less blood, you take the inflammation away, you take the source of infectious risk away. So that's why we're doing this. And you see in their study in Annals of Surgery 1989, you see the mortality went from 45 conservative treatment to 9%. So a massive decrease what uh, confirms the indication for early excision. So how do we cover the wounds? Once the patient comes to us, how do we graft? How do we cover the wounds? Everybody is, of course, autograft, yes. Allograft, yes. But is there something else? Can we do something else? Like when we have a big burn, what are we going to do? If we have an infected wound, when we have a complex wound, again, I'm not going to massively elaborate. Dr. Rogers will take over. But these are questions that we have to ask. What can you put on, just briefly for you, when you're outside sitting there doing something? Uh, BioBrain is an aspect for superficial wounds, um, that uh, superficial partial that you can basically put on patients to heal. And it's a nice option. And, uh, but it doesn't really induce a cellular. It, it, for deep burns, it's not really suitable. Uh, what do we do when we have these deep burns? Well, you have the CA, cultured epithelial autografts. We do a skin biopsy, you grow the keratinocytes eight weeks later. And I used to say, well, the patient eight weeks later is either covered or he's dead. 
I took eight weeks, it costs hundreds of thousands of dollars, and you put these little uh, keratinic keratinocyte sheets on. But it was the first kind of tissue engineering aspect what we did um, and tried to improve or tried to get these big burn, massive burns to survive. But uh, there were various issues with this. We then moved on to develop some, derm some dermal substrate, put dermis on, uh, dermal substrates on, and put cells on or not cells on. So the Europeans used the metroderm, uh, the, Euro the Austrian Burns Center in Vienna used those, get some good results when it's deep, but uh, they also now combine it with stem cells. The other, the other component, what you know, is when you have a big burn, you have a deep excision, uh, uh, the, uh, the integral, all right. Two minutes. <laughs> it's only my alarm, I'm, uh... no, 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 I have two minutes left. Anyway, Integra is another one to control. You see here, if it's deep, you excise, you place the Integra as a dermal substrate, you graft over it, you have some reasonable outcome where you see here conventional treatment versus Integra. So that's an option that you have as well. Why is it not going forwards? CSS, you place uh, cells on Integra, very similar problems to CEA. Um, it's very expensive, but however, it's a tissue engineering product that works. And last in two slides, again, Dr. Rogers hopefully will talk a little about it too. What is important for you to diagnose inhalation injury? Uh, you need to diagnose it by bronchoscopy. If you have it, you need to treat it early. Because we know when you look at cohorts, if you have somebody a mortality without inhalation injury, 4% versus 56% with inhalation injury. And you need to start it right away. So there is protocols, heparin, acetylcysteine, the vitamin E, there are various aspects that you have to do, but you have to bronch a patient. You have to diagnose this, you have to vent, you have to treat as ASAP. And again, what you have to do is to, you look for all these diagnostic tools, uh, make sure you ventilate accordingly. And uh, again, here in more detail, that it actually makes the biggest difference, not in the big burns, but in those medium 20 to 80, the ones that you see. That's where it makes the biggest difference. And we believe it's due to, in these patients, causing immune paralysis that then leads to increased infection and death. So uh, here is your, your, they require more fluids, which you do not fall for. You need to watch out for these casts. You start with heparin and uh, acetylcysteine, and you can see the improvement in mortality from 19 to 4%, which is current standard of care. Again, another study by Dr. Desai and Dr. Hernan. Um, and again, then you add, this is some, just some pictures, what Anne will, hope, will enlighten us a little bit later. It's burn is a chronic disease. A burn is not done when the patient leaves the hospital. And you can see this progression, you can see this girl. And I like to close with this, that you ask yourself, why are we keeping her alive? Why are we doing all this? So just looking at this girl, this poor girl that looks terrible. And we have our patients that just uh, look, again, it's not fair to say, but they don't look good, right? But these kids are amazing, some adults are amazing. We call it now post-traumatic growth. And again, why are we doing this? This is the same girl. You see the mortality have improved, but do we do something for them? Do we improve their quality of life? Well, she, that's the same girl, uh, Dr. Meyer and Dr. Blake needed studies in kids and adults and found this improved uh, social behavior and uh, improved quality of life. They're very differentiated. They're very, very much aware of what they have. Again, they're growing. And this is, this is her. She graduated from medical school, two, kid, two children, married. She is actually, in fact, practicing as a burn surgeon. And uh, we, have another, we have another patient who is also a burn surgeon. And Dr. Blakeney did, uh, created this with Dr. Meyer again. They were unbelievable psychologists, psychiatrists. And that so few of these survivors have developed psychological, so for difficulties, a striking testament to human resilience. Therefore, it's not always easy. But the question is, I don't think it's for us to ask. I think we take the patient, we do the best we can. Some of our patients will probably grow post-traumatically, and Anne will talk about it. Some of our patients will not. But that's the chance we shouldn't be taking for us to decide initially. Anyway, I'm out of my time and happy to answer any questions you have.